we're, we're thrilled uh, to have Gordon and Carol Siegel here today who endowed this institution and empowered us at Northwestern to think like designers and to act like designers. So Gordon and Carol, thank you. And now I'd like to introduce um, the McCormick School of Engineering Dean, Julio Atino. Julio. So, for about 10 years, we ran something called Design Chicago. And we took a step backward and refined and reframed our effort to have a broader viewpoint in order to bring some of the biggest names in design innovation. And so we're starting today launching the Seagull Design Leadership Series. Uh, when we thought what kind of people or even companies we would like to highlight in this series, um, IBM was at the top of the list. They got involved in design thinking way, way before the topic became fashionable. And we are going to hear about the efforts within IBM. It's a massive, massively large organization from Phil Gilbert. A design, of course, is at the very basis of how we do things in McCormick. Everything starts with design thinking and communication, and then it goes all the way up to the end, reaching things like Triple M. And I would like to think that design affects the way that our students think, but also affects the way that the organization itself runs. Um, I don't think that without the design component, we will operate in exactly the same way from a management viewpoint. IBM exemplifies also the interface between design and engineering and technology. And it's something that we also, in some scale, we try to balance. The deep scientific contributions, technological achievements, with the creativity that is brought by design thinking. And we thought of no better place to launch this series that by inviting Phil Gilbert, who will tell us what's going on in IBM. Phil. Thank you, Dino Tino. Greg, thank you very much. Uh, it's such a privilege to uh, be here today. Uh, let's see if we can get this going. Uh, start out slow and then I fizzle out all together. So <laughs> that's how this is You're getting credit for it, so it's okay. Uh, you know, I think as we think about design, and I, I have, I don't know, four or five kind of themes that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Talk about kind of why we do what we do. I'll try to give you a sense of at least where we think we are on the journey of, of IBM itself, to be honest. Uh, give you a little bit of a flavor of, 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 of the power of design thinking, although that's going to be something that's probably a little bit more known to you. And then I'll get into a little bit of kind of the gorpy details of how we actually have, uh, how we think about this and how we have begun to think about the governance of why, of, of design itself. First of all, it starts, though, with who we are. Uh, our program didn't just materialize. In fact, uh, our design program was one of the first uh, corporate design programs in the world, certainly the first in America. Started in 1956. Our first head of design was an architect named Elliot Noyes. Noyes is the credited designer of the Selectric typewriter. And so it very much goes way back. And it's interesting, when you go back and reflect on what Noyes said back in the 1970s as he was reflecting about IBM, 
somebody was talking about IBM's specific tactical role in the world. And it was talking about computing and technology. And it was very interesting what Noyes said. And I think it gets to the heart of why we feel design is so important. He said, IBM is not about any specific technology or any specific trend. IBM simply helps humans master their environment. And we've done that through the years. You know, it started with something like punch cards. It's when we started to scale this notion of compute, tabulation. In fact, we were, we were asked to do the very first census. The reason was is we could begin to scale the tabulating capability of machines. We started exploring, and as computing itself and the possibilities of silicon became more and more obvious, we started taking those to other places, extraterrestrial places. And after that, we led the world in connecting itself. And we started thinking about connections and connectors and how these things, machines, start talking with each other. Today, it's very interesting. A lot of people feel like we've taken a step forward. I personally actually think that we've, in a sense, taken a step backwards. And we're starting to think about this question of scale again. In the way that we used to think about scaling compute, today we start thinking about how do we scale the massive amounts of digital data that is now available in the world. And it's not simply that we have to start understanding unstructured data in new ways and scaling that unstructured data. This data is everywhere. And if you go back to that founding notion of thinking about IBM as serving humanity and putting the systems of the world in service of people, giving humans the ability to master their work environments, we think that today's technologies not only need to be thought about in their technical possibilities, but they also have to be ethically and morally considerate to the humans that those systems serve. Now, this is interesting because this notion of ethic, ethically and morally considerate to the humans that they serve requires way more than just science. Design helps us understand that. Design helps us navigate those constraints. And by understanding these oftentimes competing demands, we're not only able to deliver more meaningfully against IBM's vision, but we also do it faster and better and more efficiently. And that's really the story that I'm going to tell you now. Specifically, a design program that's built to provide designers with the freedom to innovate and the power to act. A design program that integrates human-centered concepts into the processes and the mental models of all IBMers. And also moves IBM from a place where solutions are sold to a place where co-creations are made. All of this because we choose to adopt the design mindset. Now, we didn't start here. In fact, uh, the story, at least my story, started in 2010. I came to IBM via an acquisition. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I did startups for 30 years. I had three startups. Sold my first one in 1995. Second one started in 1997, sold it in 2000. And in 2002, started startup number three and it was bought by IBM in 2010. Now, I'm sure all of you all want to go work for a startup that does business process management software, right? <laughs> Come on, business process management, really. It's pretty awesome. This is boring middleware. 
it's as boring as it gets. It was kind of interesting though, our product, uh, our product was winning the marketplace not because we did anything at all that other companies couldn't do, but for some reason we had users that actually loved our product. In fact, for a, for a, for a product that at, at its core tied systems together and automated business processes and interacted with the humans in that way, we had a surprising number of people, line of business people, that loved what we did. And so we got bought by IBM, and it was kind of an interesting acquisition for IBM, because in this, in this particular case, and take note of this, all of you design thinkers out there, we didn't do anything that IBM didn't do. It was a very unusual acquisition. Most acquisitions have some accretive technology that you're bringing to the table. We didn't do anything that IBM didn't do. And in fact, when we got there, uh, and I was asked a couple of months later to lead a portfolio of, a, of about 44 products, what I was asked to do actually was, whatever you did, please bring it here. This was in 2010. And so for the next 18 months, we put together what has become our design and design thinking program at IBM. At the end of that 18 months, we took a portfolio of about 44 products and we turned it into four. Uh, we went from, uh, we, we, we roughly doubled the revenues over 18 months in a market space that was growing at about 10% a year. So we took massive market share. And we took about 1,000 people, about 1,000 engineers, and we remixed that group. We actually ended up with about 700 people total building those products, but we changed the ratios and we added about 100 formally trained designers into that mix. And as a result of moving from an all STEM to more of a STEAM team, we radically changed the outcome that was delivered. And so as we looked around IBM at the beginning in 2012, uh, in fact when our current chairman, Jenny Rometty, uh, took over, uh, who's, a, who's an alum of, of, of Northwestern. We looked around the company and we realized that the outcomes we were generating across the board were not bold enough. And we weren't moving fast enough for the market demands. And we had to get to that state. We had to start delivering experiences that users loved. And more importantly, we had to start delivering those outcomes at a pace and scale that was unprecedented before that. This focus on outcomes is what led us to design and design thinking. The process itself is great, and the process is what gets you there, but you have to realize that no business cares about design thinking. No business cares about design per se. Businesses care about the outcomes generated by those practices. And so as we started thinking about what is the, most, the single most impactful lever that we can pull that will generate the outcomes that were required for today's world, it turns out that design and design thinking were those levers. We created a simple formula. The formula that we created said people, we have to change our people and we have to add new people. We had to change our practices. We had to move to a more agile world, but more importantly, we had to move to a more intentional world where outcomes were, good outcomes were generated, and we also had to rethink our places. And in fact, if we looked honestly at ourselves at the time, we had a lot of skills gaps. Our practices were not human-centered, and we weren't necessarily prioritizing our work based on the needs of the people using our products and services. And the places we were doing this didn't reinforce the high degree of collaboration that we needed. And so we embarked on a program to change all three of those things at scale. At the root of it though, is this notion of bold, fast outcomes. Here's the funny thing about being bold. The thing that we've learned over and over and over, Greg touched on it earlier, the only way to be truly bold is to be incredibly humble. In fact, I have a, I have a, my own definition, my own definition for 
curiosity, which is, I think, what's at the root of everything that we try to instill in our people today, is this notion, this, this notion and you'll see it in a minute, of restless reinvention. The world needs constant curiosity today. And to me, curiosity is simply humility plus ambition. You have to be humble to be curious, inherently. If you're not humble, you think you know everything. You don't. You think you know your user. You don't. You're not your user. And so we bring that humility to our work every day. And we've instilled it enough to say we're not our user. There's always something to learn. And the team is smarter than the individual. And this is really an interesting thing that we've discovered. It's probably not new. That in today's world, the team is the atomic element of work anymore. It takes a lot of people to get something to market. And that team has to be intentionally formed in a way that we've never really considered before. I mean, if you think about the implication, especially in the digital world, if you think about the implication of what, what, what power the cloud and the internet has provided us, it allows us to immediately deliver things in a much broader context than has ever happened before. And the only possible way that we can hit the mark of that broader market is to deliver outcomes that are much more intentionally understanding of the diversity of the world than ever before. And so if you roll that back and you start thinking we require outcomes that are more ubiquitously loved, we have to make sure that a more reflective perspective is baked into those outcomes, those products. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the inputs into that product reflect that diversity. All right, roll that back. If the inputs to the product is a team, then we have to be much more intentional about the way we form teams and who is on those teams. One of the things that we've baked into our practice of design thinking is not simply interdisciplinary teaming, but diversity as a, as a fundamental element of making sure that the team gets to the right and the, that the probability of the team getting to the right answer is as high as possible. These three things, this humility about user, this humility about practices, and this notion of teaming form the basis for our overall corporate transformation. These three principles, they're very simple now to recite a focus on user outcomes, constant iteration, prototyping, restless reinvention, and diverse empowered teams. This is the basis for everything we do. It's the basis for our version of design thinking. We started rolling this out. 2013 was the first large class of designers. We established my group, which was called IBM Design, which was on the tip of the spear of the overall transformation of IBM that we knew had to happen in this new cloud-based world and this new cognitive era that we've ushered in. And as we started rolling this out, we realized that this notion, this focus on user-centeredness, this constant iteration, a world of continuous delivery because the world is being rewritten in code, and this notion that our teams had to be much more intentionally formed and much more intentionally diverse. That leads you straight into this thing that we call design thinking. It's inescapable. If you think about agile, right, 
Agile will get you somewhere fast. It will. And in fact, the underpinning execution me mechanism underneath all of our teams is Agile-based delivery. But the thing about Agile is it has no soul. It has no compass. There's no morality to it. So how do you get to an intentional outcome that is, in fact, human-centered? There has to be something else. We think it's design thinking. We started working with all the different models. We started rolling it out in 2013. We started with seven teams. I'll give you a, a bit of the ending today. Today, we've brought on board over the last four and a half years 1,600 formally trained designers. We have over 1,000 teams simultaneously practicing design thinking. And we have over 100, it's actually 110,000 certified practicing design thinkers at IBM today. But we didn't get there immediately. In fact, we struggled. We started rolling out these models. And what was interesting about it is because we had all been steeped in these practices of design and design thinking, we understood what they meant. You know, empathize, define, ideate, prototype. But I will tell you that we put this in front of dozens and then hundreds of people. And they all said, whoa, whoa. We can't stop. We can't stop and empathize. We've got to deliver. The world doesn't let us stop. And we're like, no, 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 you don't stop. You, you just always empathize. You keep going. And they said, well, hold on. We can't, we can't wait to prototype. We're already delivering. We're in market. Well, uh, OK. It turned out that with all of these models, we kept getting feedback that said, you can't be putting a waterfall process in front of us because it's the antithesis of everything we've been doing since about the year 2000. Now, what was interesting is we, as design thinkers, kept going, Th that's not what it means. It's not what it means. We were on our back heels. And I will tell you, this happened over and over and over again. Maybe you guys have heard this. I don't know. As you've tried to overlay it onto a team, they would get into their mindset that you're trying to go back to a waterfall world. Now, by the way, this wasn't a one-way street. Uh, it turns out, and this is where you turn the cameras off, because it turns out that there are designers who also have closed mindsets. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. But we had designers that actually did think you needed to stop and wait and understand. You, you needed to stop and wait and develop empathy. We had teams of people, of designers and engineers and product managers, that would get in arguments about who was more user-centered. We, I'm not kidding. We had arguments about who knew the user the best. We actually created a slogan after we realized what was happening. We said, okay, empathy is good. Empathy first with ourselves, then with our users. So we started thinking about this, and we actually started kind of saying, you know, wait a second. If you hear something once, twice, three times, four times, if you hear something 100 or 200 times, maybe, maybe it's us. Maybe it's me. It's not you. And so we spent about 18 months really noodling on this. And we started thinking about what really we were trying to do. And forgetting the, the visual depiction of everything, what, was it, what were we really trying to do? And we kept kind of with each other and my core team. And then we'd work, out, work it out with teams in the business. And we'd start really trying to get under the covers of what it was we were trying to convey to them with this thing that we called design thinking. And we kept coming back to this thing, which was a loop. And this was, at the end of the day, what we wanted to do was to help our teams get through a loop as many times and as quickly as possible. The loop is based on three fundamental traits. The first is observing people. Observing, and by the way, observing together, immersing ourselves in our user's world, and then reflecting on those observations, and then making, and then reflecting, and then observing, and then reflecting, and then remaking, on and on and on. Now, this is, seems kind of a simple thing, but this is the basis of what we call 
IBM design thinking. It is called, ingeniously enough, the loop. And it's the place where we teach our teams to spend time. And it was kind of funny, the minute we introduced this, and it was one of those things that, you know, it took 18 months to happen overnight kind of thing. Uh, but the minute we introduced this and we started using this as the metaphor for how we would all together get through this process, uh, things changed. Things changed fundamentally. So now we had the principles, the focus on user, focus on the user. User's the North Star. The second one, restless reinvention. Let's get through the loop as many times as we can, and whenever we have to ship, we ship, but we keep going through the loop. We're constantly delivering. And we're creating teams more intentionally, and those teams are more diverse in all aspects. Yes, skills. Yes, gender. Yes, cultures. Yes, countries. Everything. And then we realized that we needed one more thing, which was, how do you do this at scale? How do you do this in very complex teaming environments? So we established three things that we call the keys to IBM design thinking. The tactics that we use to actually scale these processes. Because one thing that we all have discovered is it's very difficult to scale this. You gotta have, it, it's built for teams that are physically together. It's built for teams that are rapid fire in these lightweight sessions or seemingly lightweight sessions where things and ideas happen quickly. And post-its go up, we talk about the post-its, we group the post-its, and these, these lightweight practices become, they're, they're very powerful by, by virtue of them being lightweight. Well, in our world, and I think in much of the world, the teams that are actually required to bring something to market are way, way bigger than that. Yes, you can have a small team that actually builds something. But in order to actually take it to market, you need salespeople aligned around it. You need marketing people. You need lawyers and finance people pricing it. And if you operate as we do in multiple countries, you need to do that across multiple geographies. And because, as I said earlier, of the nature of the internet today, uh, it's all happened simultaneously. It's, it's very difficult to just roll something out like we used to in some local environment. It takes a big team to do that. And so we needed some tactics to actually start aligning these more complex teams around these concepts that were embodied in design thinking. And so these three concepts are, first of all, I skip one, yeah. First of all, this notion of playbacks. These aren't scrums, these aren't the things that the execution teams do, but they are, thi they, they, are, they are moments in time that a team pulls together the broader set of stakeholders around a particular idea or project and actually displays the work in progress. It's very much like a design charrette, but it's to a much larger set of stakeholders. And so now we're not, only, we're not only getting feedback and exposing our work, we are inherently gaining alignment across a broad team. The second thing is we all know that we have to do field research, but there's something missing from just doing field research. There's an intimacy sometimes that you actually want, uh, especially in products and in product areas where you do not have domain. Uh, typically in a consumer environment, going out and doing field research is enough. In a B2B environment where there are intricacies to any particular job and task and downstream dependencies that you may not observe, you need something more. We call these people sponsor users. And after we have done research and after we have aligned the team around the hill that we're going to take, we actually go to recruit specific people that spend a lot of time very intimately with the product team from day one. These are not beta customers. That's way too late in the process, and that's a ridiculous program. These are people that are actually helping us create the right thing for them, for their jobs. And finally, we have these things called hills. Uh, have any of you all uh, been in the military? Okay couple of hands. Uh, there's a notion 
that is called commander's intent that is actually a very powerful notion. And it's essentially this. It's when you're in a situation uh, like a battlefield, uh, the things that actually happen on the ground, the things that individual, in this case soldiers or squads, are dealing with, they're all unknown. And while you can rehearse all you want, you run into unknown obstacles all the time. So the question that they started, the military started dealing with back in the really 1950s was how do I communicate the intent to all my people without actually having to simulate the specific scenario that they're going to encounter. And especially when you get into the digital world where programmers are deep into source code, where all sorts of snakes and dragons and monsters live, how do you align all of those people around the design intention so that they can do their job and you don't get, you don't get bottlenecked every day? So we started working on this a long time ago. It's formalized into a notion called hills. And these hills are actually the foundational documents of any particular team at any particular point in time. At IBM, we try to work on three and only three hills at any given, uh, for a, a team at IBM, three and only three hills at any point in time. Now, these hills are not necessarily simultaneous. They, they end and they start at different times. But you basically want your team working on three things at any point in time, plus the backlog. These are kind of analogous to user stories and epics, but they're not exactly. But they are things that everybody can rally around. So this basically, these things form the totality of how we practice design thinking at IBM. Uh, IBM design thinking is rested in these three principles that I've talked about. It's about getting teams through the loop as many times and as fast as possible together with their sponsor users, aligned around a set of hills, and constantly exposing their work and getting feedback from a broad set of stakeholders through these things called playbacks. Playbacks have one more superpower, by the way, before I kind of move on, because I know that some of you are, are interested in kind of organizational and behavioral design and, and management. When you get into any company, and I've been in companies from all sizes, I started my first company on my own. I hired uh, my first employee, who then became uh, my partner in that company, and everything was awesome. Uh, when we hired our uh, third person, uh, everything went to hell. Uh, we were too big. And uh, it's kind of interesting that that third person, uh, it's the first time you can hold a meeting when not everybody is present. And that's the root of almost all dysfunction, is a lack of alignment and thinking you're out of the loop and losing trust, ultimately. And so, uh, this, these playbacks, you know, once you start hiring and you get more people, then you start creating hierarchies and then you start having uh, silos. And I know that there are no silos in, in, a, in a university setting. Uh, and all the schools communicate very freely with one another. But uh, it turns out it's not that way in the business world. Uh, and so uh, we couldn't just uh, say that we were forming meetings. Uh, in our world, if you called a meeting, to talk about work, what it meant was, oh, whoa, 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 you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna talk to so-and-so? Well, you need, I'm your manager. You need to tell me first. So you'd have a pre-meeting. And once you had the pre-meeting, well, the manager scrubbed anything negative. And of course, once then their manager, because you were going to show it to somebody, a uh, senior vice president, so their manager had to, had to get involved, and they scrubbed it. And by the time you actually get to the audience that's useful to you, uh, there's absolutely nothing of value in the presentation. So I couldn't change that. I didn't feel like we could, you know, that, that's just ingrained. That's just human nature, really, to, 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 to do that. And so we created playbacks as a special space. We invented a word that really didn't exist in any methodology. It didn't exist and doesn't exist in agile, doesn't exist in design thinking. It's a playback. What's a playback? A playback is where we all show up. And for this moment in time, everybody's an equal. And by the way, we're not going to talk about operational metrics. We're not going to talk about revenues and all that in a playback. That's for a different meeting. And that's a valuable meeting, but it's not this meeting. This meeting is about the work. 
and it's about criticism of the work itself as peers. And just because, and I'll never forget the first time that the power of this was shown. Of course, these playbacks uh, in our company happen, a lot of them happen over, you know, uh, uh, WebEx or Zoom or whatever. And one of the very first, uh, early in the program, there was a person on the phone that I knew was one of our senior vice presidents. At IBM, that's, you have our chairman, uh, Jenny, and then you have senior vice presidents. That's way up, way up the top of the tree. And literally, a pretty fresh out of master's program uh, design researcher uh, who did not know who the SVP was. And he made some statement which was wrong. And she said, well, no, actually, over the phone, right, over the, over the, over the WebEx. And it was, no, actually, you're wrong, and here's the data. You know, that would never happen in a normal setting. And, and Robert was awesome, and he immediately took it on board. He's like, you have the data. Like, that, and that sent its own signal. But uh, I guess my bigger point is, for those of you who you know, are, are, are thinking about you know, how do you institute change management, these are some of the issues that you have to deal with are what is the culture of the organization, and to the extent that you want to present a countercultural concept, it's not necessarily about changing the company. Sometimes it's about adding a new space to the company. And that's actually, that's actually uh, picked up very well. Real quick, I'm going to tell you a, a kind of a, a story, and then I'll get back to some meat. One of, our, one of our projects that we do, we've actually formalized a, what we call an incubation program at IBM, a, a lot of the work that we come out of uh, research with. Uh, and here's a, here's a brief for you. Here was the brief that this team was given. Uh, productize a cognitive deep search technology that leverages a trained knowledge graph. <laughs> Sound interesting? Right? As a designer, if you were given a brief that said productize a cognitive deep search technology that leverages a trained knowledge graph, you would know exactly what to do, right? <laughs> well, that is pretty much what uh, a lot of our products at IBM look like. <laughs> it looks like an engineer wanted to do that very thing. Uh, we put this problem uh, with our IBM research people that had actually done some amazing work in AI and machine learning around this problem. And we started pointing at people, uh, pointing a set of designers over a period of about 11 weeks at this problem. And they went out into the field. They started talking to some of these researchers. They started understanding what the space was. One example of that would be uh, airlines where it's actually probably the, the safest way to travel these days. And while we can thank a lot of the operations people and pilots and all that, uh, the fact is that it's materials science that's probably contributed as much to that safety as anything else. And so these people started saying, all right, well, if that's the case, you know, what is interesting about this space? It turns out that in this materials science space, about $2 billion per year is spent per company in materials science research. And the vast majority of that spend is in the beginning phases, which is multiple years, but in the beginning phases of any particular application of technology searching for materials. And so they went to the field, they realized that these uh, researchers were using Google, and one of the huge problems about with Google search is it still gives you, you know, a ton of results. So a lot of time is wasted based on this. These people put together a team, it was a team of about uh, seven uh, designers, uh, and I think, uh, well, I've got it here. They started talking about, talking with these multidisciplinary teams, they spanned four countries. These were both PhD candidates, PhDs, as well as practitioners in the field. And over a period of about 11 weeks, they started getting very involved with their sponsor users. And they started seeing who they really were, what they did in the field, and they started really realizing the human problem of why traditional search mechanisms uh, in this materials uh, science space were so inadequate. They started identifying the human problems around this very powerful but raw technology. And so these people, most of whom were fresh out of college, either undergraduate or masters, had to start building their domain expertise. And they did that through their sponsor users, through these people that I've talked about. 
they started prototyping the mental models of how research happens with these people. And uh, got alignment. This was their hill. I've talked to you about hills. Introduce a new search paradigm based on cognitive technologies while leveraging a familiar interaction pattern so that we can integrate new approaches to how this research is done. They pulled together playbacks. They got everybody in the loop. And what they ended up prototyping was something exceedingly human-centered. It starts with a very familiar starting point. You just enter your search. And out of that search, you start getting back. Uh, in this case, these were articles. And as you, as you hover over the articles, uh, you're able to kind of get a quick understanding, an abstract of what that article is about. In this case, we also introduced this notion of concept searches. Our AI is able to conceptually locate this, all of this different unstructured information around these, the chemistries of these underlying uh, materials. And as you hovered over these conceptual results, uh, you start to identify the different patterns that happened. And uh, what you end up with is something that the end users love. And they say, I want this. And that happened with 11 weeks. One of the things that we started baking into our approach to give us an early understanding of whether our design thinking methods were working is net promoter score. And so everything now, and all services, all offerings, as well as our internal employee facing uh, offerings and experiences, all have net promoter scores associated with them. In this case, this particular offering, uh, which we'll be delivering this spring, had a 67 net promoter score and universally positive responses. In a, in a scientific domain like this, a 67 net promoter score is off the chart. We've also got multiple patent filings, and we'll be shipping this in the spring of this year, 11 weeks starting late last summer, and shipping a product like this in the spring, and this is the team that did it. This begins to prove the power of what we're doing with design and design thinking at IBM. This is what we're doing with this team. It's what we're doing with uh, various offering teams. We've started doing it for our, uh, for our employee facing, all of our employee facing experiences. In this case, this particular example, we're using uh, design thinking to actually under better understand, empathize with, and hopefully solve the problem of uh, retention of mid-career women in this particular example. Uh, we're applying design thinking now to the manager's experience at IBM uh, to, to try to reimagine that. We're using it for strategic planning, for account planning. Our sales teams are now using design thinking as the way we actually show up and engage with our clients every day. As I said before, we now have well over 1,000 teams all across IBM uh, practicing in this new way, all using IBM design thinking, all going through the loop, creating hills, holding playbacks, and actually engaging with real users of those products and services. All of this is in service of what we started to do in 2012, which was to create a sustainable culture of design and design thinking at IBM. This is actually the onboarding. We have a uh, pretty major onboarding of, of, of designers every summer. This is uh, one, of the, one of the early days of one of our boot camps uh, for designers. We have 1,600 formally trained designers across IBM. And just to give you a little bit of insight, some of the gorpiness of kind of how we think about designers as career tracks and how we've done some of the organizational and governance mechanisms. For those of you who are interested, I thought I'd share a little bit out of some of our uh, normally confidential materials that we cover internally. First of all, we've published a, a career path for designers. Uh, our career path for designers actually looks fairly typical at earlier career levels. But once you get into the mid-career stages, you actually have an opportunity at IBM to either choose to go on a more business track, which may be design leadership, it may be product management, or it may be something else. 
uh, or you can actually continue to focus on your craft and just like our engineers can become distinguished engineers and ultimately IBM fellows, we also have a path to distinguished designer and that same IBM fellowship for designers. In fact, in 2017, we named IBM's first formally trained designer as one of our IBM fellows. There are 195 or so IBM fellows ever. There are about 80 living, practicing IBM fellows today. This is a tremendous, a tremendous honor, and this individual is a tremendous designer. So we work with our designers as well as our design thinkers all the way up this. In fact, we're, we're about to announce our next round of, design, of distinguished designers and then the, the first step up to that, design principles. And both design thinkers at IBM as well as designers at IBM can follow this individual contributor career path all the way up into the executive ranks. We started thinking about this notion of sustainability. And I think one of the, one of the other things that I'd like to mention about th that is a difference between the way we've approached our program and the way most design programs are structured. Uh, most design programs are actually structured uh, just like a, a design firm, just like a studio. And uh, projects come to it, and there is teaming with teams that happen on a transactional basis. Designs are handed off, and maybe they're acted on or not. We actually intentionally decided on a very different model, and that was to embed our designers directly into the business. So while our designers work in physical spaces that are design studios, and there's designers working in, on every part of the business in our studios, we have now 44 studios in the world, uh, we actually embed the designers themselves on the teams. And so I thought it might be of interest to some of you to kind of see how that's happened. Uh, when we started out, uh, underneath this tools, we spent a lot of time and effort in building a new tool chain for our multidisciplinary teams. So uh, our multidisciplinary teams, think of that primarily as product management, engineering, and design, all have 100% access to each other's assets. There is a radical transparency to the work that's happening at IBM. So there's a tool chain underneath these, what we call whole teams, like the whole brain. We started in our product area, that's where we focused initially, and we began working at that craft level in our services, delivering design services uh, with our clients, and we did a little bit for uh, internal work. But just to give you a sense of how we've scaled that out over the years, uh, a couple of years after we started the program, we started a process of getting design executives, actually formally trained designers at the executive level, leading the, uh, at the business leadership level across the various divisions. I've got four vertical bars here, there's actually uh, about 13 or 14 divisions across IBM. So these are all representative of others. This was where we were a couple of years ago. Last year we had our first fellow and our uh, first through the ranks promotion to vice president levels, both in our products and services areas. Uh, our HR group and our CIO, which is responsible for our internal employee experiences, started building more and more teams. Uh, and today, we have design executives in literally every division across IBM. It is deeply embedded into not just the DNA of how we work, but actually organizationally where we work and, and where we live. Uh, design truly has a seat at the, at the table. What I've learned in this period of time about power is that power is actually, especially at a company like IBM or like any other uh, company of any size at all, power is actually not about the organizational title that you hold. It's actually being at the table. Uh, because in today's world, good ideas and good work really does surface very, very quickly. And so, uh, you know, I. I kind of encourage each of you as you think about you know, where you're going or the job you take, uh, it, it, it's less about the title you get. It's less about the power you have in terms of number of people reporting to you or not. And it's more about are you at the table, right? It's like Hamilton, you know, be in the room when the decision gets made. That really is today in this world of real-time decision making, 
it's so important to be in the room to make sure your voice is heard and make sure you hear the other voices and help those decisions get made quicker. It's the number, yeah, there you go. It's the, it's the number one impediment to speed. It's not execution, it's not writing code, it's not doing design, it's making the call. And uh, if, you can help, if you can help your team and help your organization make the call a little bit quicker, you'll do better work. IBM's a big place. This is just a little, this is, this is my recruiting slide. If you're any of these people, <laughs> please come up afterwards. I'd love to meet you. Uh, we've since, we've now put uh, our version of design thinking on a digital platform. Uh, by the time, I guess, this video is released, uh, make sure this is released after March 7th, please. Uh, but we're going to be announcing the Enterprise Design Thinking by IBM platform is going to be available publicly. Uh, today we have about 110, as I said, 110,000 badged IBMers. We also are now working with multiple clients and uh, we will have, uh, you know, we're sharing this with the world. We think if we can get the world of uh, enterprises uh, thinking in this way, uh, we think it will all be, all be better off. As a part of that, we had to completely revamp curriculum. Uh, as, as, as awesome as people are uh, coming out of industry or coming out of schools, we think there's a few things that are still left to be, left to be taught, especially how do, we, how do we accelerate that empathy and trust among teammates. And so we've developed our own curriculum. Uh, we've spent a lot of time not only developing our practices, but if you want to see them, they're all available on ibm.com slash design. I would especially encourage you to take a look at ibm slash design slash thinking and IBM slash design slash research. It's a beautiful guide to user research. We've now got all these people. We govern our teams like this. This is how we, this is how we think about it. It's always about the team. This is a sample chart you can see across. The, these are all those projects across the top. You can imagine those are real projects in the world. Uh, we spend a lot of time worrying about ratios uh, other, because I have found if there's a single determining characteristic of the probability of a good outcome, there's, it's a ratio. And if you don't have about one designer for every eight coding developers, and if you don't have one designer for every two or three front end developers, the probability of getting to great is much, much lower. So we spend a lot of time thinking about our teams and the team makeup, and this is the primary tool we uh, organize around to start seeing is our team formed correctly, and there's some data behind it uh, around diversity that we, I, I, I don't have today, but that we also look at. And then we also continually look at the shape. Where are our teams? For a particular portfolio in the business, we have strategic locations that we want our designers. Uh, in this case, you'll see that both Dublin and Shanghai are represented. That's not by accident. Uh, we typically want multiple continents involved in most of our portfolios even if a particular offering may be a little bit more localized than that. And then we spend a lot of time on what the shape of our organization is. These are band levels, that's IBM speak, but you can kind of think about these as career levels. In this case, we're showing you that at the very top of the tree in the design org, there's a couple of people and the shape of the organization in this case is, is pretty healthy. We've got a lot of young, you know, earlier in their career uh, designers and some experience around them. When we started this journey uh, a long time ago, it seems like, it's not that long ago, it was just about four years ago, uh, we laid out this audacious goal of we think we need to go hire about a thousand formally trained designers. And we think we need to also affect the other 390,000 or so IBMers around them. And we have to uh, infect those other 390,000 not only with a user-centeredness but with an empathy for the power of design thinking and the power of the new designers that we were going to add to the team. And as a result of that kind of audacious statement, today we're well beyond that. And what we found is it's actually not even about design thinking and design. It's actually about culture. It's all about culture. And that is the hardest thing to actually change. 
we've tried to bring this, this mindset of making, this mindset of empathy, this humility, along with this ambition, uh, and constantly, constantly iterate, not only on the products and the offerings and the services that we're bringing, but on ourselves as well. And at IBM, uh, we have come to believe that the what we are working on is no longer as important as the how we are working. Every day in this world is, in, in fact, a prototype because what's coming tomorrow is unknown. But now we think we have a process for making sure that we're in front of it. Thank you all very much.